So thank you very much all for joining. Uh, today, of course, we're going to talk about enterprise blockchain, uh, which is something that I've been interested in for a while. Uh, I have a lot of questions here that I think are interesting to the audience. Um, I want to get into some of the technical foundings of it, but also if we can kind of hit on some of the philosophical aspects of why are we doing these things? Because I think a lot of people who are more familiar maybe with the permissionless space are saying, why are banks trying to like, do private blockchains? This makes no sense. Um, so if I can kind of just start and kick us off. Uh, Richard gave an idea about what an enterprise DLT was. I'd be curious, um, Maya and George, what do you think about his definitions and how would you define an enterprise DLT? Um, well, I guess for us, we would agree with everything that Richard said about uh, enabling participants to transact seamlessly and increased uh, operational efficiency. I'd maybe go a bit beyond that in the idea that we really can introduce new business models and new economic models just by having pseudo-anonymous participants on the same network. So we can, we can start to re-mutualize businesses that have become very centralized. Um, so if you think about clearing houses, historically they were uh, member-owned organizations. And what, what blockchain, I think, can offer is the ability to reintroduce those kind of member, member mutual models. Can, sorry, can I just ask real quick, when you talk about member mutual models, how is that different for people that aren't familiar with that market? Um, so I guess, you know, typically with a, with a CCP or a clearinghouse, it's a, a centralized uh, entity. And, and parties will, uh, you know, transact with them, but there's a, there's a rent-seeking intermediary there. So by, by decentralizing that business model, those members can transact directly with each other, uh, reducing the cost, but also potentially they can have some governance over that entity as well. So I would actually say that I think there's more and more of an overlap between the incentive or the financial incentive systems of taking part in that network, right? And in the permissionless space, we're used to talking a lot about different token incentives, mechanism design, and such of the governance nodes and supplies. Whereas in the private blockchain space, it's more about um, the equity of the investors, right? In Clearmatics, the membership um, uh, design for the governance of different uh, quarter members. Um, who has a say in a, the company that is building these private blockchains, but two, also in the consortia that are being built with this technology. Um, and in some ways, I think I find it fascinating, the dialogue between the permissioned and the permissionless space, because they're essentially trying to get at the same um, models of disintermediating the way business and finance works. Whether or not it's open and censorless, that's a philosophical decision. Um, but we cannot ignore that the majority of finance, of money, of actual capital, goes through the existing uh, business corporate world that these guys are, are working very closely with. So you're drawing a parallel between, of course, in public blockchains, having things like mining or stakers, uh, users, as well as the development teams. And you're saying that there exists a parallel inside of a permission blockchain space. Yeah, because think about it. If a company comes out and ICOs itself, it's basically saying, hey, buy a token that you can later use in the network that I'm going to end up buying. And then I'm going to maybe need to pay for the decentralization through inflation, through tokens, or maybe just you know a lump sum of fiat. Whereas the, the business world is saying, hey, we already know that we're the guys that want to build um, our own network, say B3i or um, Settlement Coin. And the participants of this network are either nodes or um, people, sorry, or entities transacting through that network. And they don't necessarily need that token, but then again, they are paying that one company that is building that, whether or not it's R3 or if it's uh, Clearmatics and giving them the funds to continue uh, developing and govern in this, governing this technology. Whereas in ICOs, you also have that one singular company that ICO'd, and if at some point there's a foundation, you know, that's an open-ended question, 
but currently the ICO company is the one leading the development, the decisions of that network. So I'm not quite sure I agree with that. So I, I agree with the bit in the middle, but you, you said something at the beginning and the end that I, I, was, I didn't think was quite right. So you, so you, 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 create, you, set, up, you, you set up a dis division between public and private blockchains. And I'm not quite sure that's one I, 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 I see, because if I look at quarter network, I would say quarter network is, is open. Anyone who can prove their identity, so there is a check, but anyone who can prove their identity can join quarter network. This isn't proprietary or private to, you know, to, 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 some, to some membership. This is, this is open to like, any company in the world. And with respect to the idea that it's somehow controlled by, by some, some group, if I look at the look at just examples of people who are building on Corda, so just, like, just, just one that jumps into my mind. Is Can a I be a node on six? Can I be a node on six? Hang on a sec. You can't on Corda Network, yes. So if I go to um, a firm who's building on Corda um, in, um, in, in, in Canada you know, to deal with um, you know, royalties for oil and gas under people's houses, there's no banks involved in that. And if I look at Corda Network, Corda Network's governance, like I said, go to Corda.network, not controlled by R3, it's an independent foundation, not-for-profit. The people who sit on that board, um, I think you know, they, there's actually a process that shows like, how, how they're selected, how they're voted, what they vote on, what they do when they disagree. They can fire R3 as the operator. It's, um, I would argue the governance of that is more transparent than a network that, that's governed by you know, a, a cabal of miners in some other country. So it's, um, it's completely wide open. I'll agree with that. Yeah. That's not the, the question that I think is, is the parallel. Um, I think that there's also a sort of convergence that's going on, right? We're going to have all these new public chain, Definity, um, Cosmos, Polkadot. And a lot of these layer two projects are very similar in terms of the architecture to um, the little networks, the networks that are built on the Corda network, right? If it's the B3i or the 6 um, and so forth. And they themselves will be perhaps permission just as much as those, um, as those implementations of Corda. Um, however, the Corda network might be open source, but not anyone can be a validator on these uh, on the channel or in one of actually these. You can. Networks. We actually document as well how you can um, how you can become a validator and what the independent board, I guess, independent of us, you know, what what they will need to see um, from you in terms of the algorithm you run and how you operate to to get to get approved as a validator. And because of the way Corda works, if you want to configure a group of nodes to trust a validator of their choice. You can do that. Corda supports multiple validators on the same network. So. Okay. Can we define that a bit? So if we, if we were to draw a parallel, um, in, in something like a Corda network, and I'm, I'm interested in how, how you're looking at that in Clearmatics as well, yeah. there's somebody proposing a transaction. That transaction is confirmed in a process akin to mining um, without doing the hashing. Um, who is the validator in that step? How does that look? How is that different in, in what you're looking at? Yeah, so, so we call them. We, there's a, there's, a, there's a kind of a running joke inside R3. I'm, I'm not allowed to name things anymore because everything I name, I get wrong. And I came up with, so that we, we call our validators notaries. And I've, I call them notaries because I'm, I'm from the UK and we don't have notaries. And my, you know, I have this pejorative mental model of a notary. Is this like this overpriced, overpaid functionary in continental Europe who just stamps documents without looking at them, which is a really sort of like bad way of looking at things. And then I discovered people take notaries really seriously in some parts of the world. And, when, and, and now because they think Corda has notaries, they get all scared and they think there's some sort of legal implication. Well, actually, the notary encoder, it's just like the ordering service in, in, in Fabric, for example. It's, a, it's either a service, so centralized if you want it to be, and, and weirdly, some people do want it to be centralized, or operated by a collection of mutually distrusting nodes running a BFT algorithm. It is a service that you send a transaction to, and if that transaction doesn't conflict with one that's previously been confirmed, so the, the, the confirmation process that a miner also does, then they sign the transaction to say it has now been confirmed. And we call them, we call them, we call them notaries. Who can be one? Um, if you're running your own network, clearly it's up to you. If you're on Corda network, you can run in your own segregated zone, and it's up to you. If you run on the main Corda network, where the, the risks are higher because there's more business and more value being transacted, then there is a, there's a, there's a, there's a review process that the independent board um, goes through to check that you meet the standard. Question. Hmm. So, like, for example, is XRP part of the review process? What was the Meaning, question, sir? You, you were talking earlier about who can be a validator, who can be a node, how are decision made. Mm -hmm. And this was, like, in contrast to the incentive uh, design and how it's similar in terms of being permissionless in public to anyone to, 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 um, to agree on. And my question is really, 
given the fact that you guys very recently launched the XRP uh, setter, was that something that was mutually decided on in the governance, or is that something that is a byproduct of R3's interests uh, within the, the equity mechanism? And, right. and just, just, just like to be clear, should... wait, hold on, just, yeah. to, just to be clear, this isn't a refute or anything, this is just a point about the incentives within the entities that end up building these technologies have a say at some end point and in uh, d different segments of this development and can't just be disregarded. And that's sure. part of the beauty no, of blockchain. That's fine, that's fine. Yeah, so, so I, think, I think you're conflating two things. So, so there's no, the, the Corda Settler is, is code. It's open source code. You can download it from GitHub, github.com slash Corda, and the Settler's there. Um, it's deployed at endpoints. Individual nodes who want to run it can run it if they want to settle across any of the payment rails that the settler supports. Currently, XLP and Swift GPI. You can add other ones. It's open source. Um, it's it's kind of orthogonal to the network. The network doesn't know how you're choosing to settle. It's it's a matter for the participants. So there's. Right now, you know, we don't run nodes because we're not transacting. We're providing the software, so we're not actually running that. That that will be run by participants on the network or on their own network. It's kind of it's kind of orthogonal. Yeah, I'd say, so maybe sort of yeah. to tie the governance and, and validation question together. So, so in fact, I, I know Corda does support uh, BFT consensus, but. Um, what the, the DFMI panel were talking about was bringing the benefits of, of trustlessness to financial transaction layer. And I think having consensus over global state and, and not assuming any, any trust on that uh, does offer, it does reduce systemic risk in, in my view. So I would argue that for, for cash on ledger and particularly regulated environments that, that reducing the levels of trust is, is a good thing for the system. Um, I think Corda has made good moves to, to introduce the foundation, uh, but, but there are still certificate signing authorities there. There's still, there's still a gate to, to get through. So there are, sort of, I think, fundamental philosophical differences in the way that, that Climatics and maybe uh, the, the Ethereum community uh, approach things as opposed to, to Corda, and, and that, that's where we differ, I think. And can you and actually, I just agree with that. Just, I mean, George is too modest to say, but I think you just open sourced um, your code, and I think that's a great move. So, well done. Thank you. Can you talk us through some of those philosophical differences? Because I don't know that they're clear to necessarily everybody in the audience. Um, well, I guess, you know, I think um, Cordor has done a, a great job of, of taking the existing financial system and, and I'd maybe argue modeling uh, current state. I think. We, we and, and the DFMI panel are very much more interested in, in modeling future state, and I think Richard spoke quite well about uh, that that increases complexity in terms of interoperability. Um, but I think we really want to take that path because we see that the benefits are, are much grander than, than sort of the iterating what we currently have. And I think we do re run the risk of uh, replicating uh, trusted intermediaries replicating uh, silos if we don't really strive for that for that end state. So we're, we're all being too polite to each other, so I'll <laughs> let that one pass. But I think, <laughs> but I think SDX think they're building the future too. So. Well, one, one thing give, I, I want to give Corda a, a compliment, actually. <laughs> um, a, they have an amazing team, but um, and we're being kind of hard of them, but that's because they're shilling all this conference. <laughs> <laughs> Head shiller. Um, I think Richard was actually one of the, uh, the, the first people who very clearly defined the role of triple book accounting on one single ledger and how that can reduce a lot of the friction points and business processes. And one of the interesting things that I think is happening long term on Corda is the fact that you have different consortia being built that can later be interconnected into one single business process. The question is whether um, it becomes a friction point or um, are we emulating the exact same business processes, including the data structures that, that are needed for documentation. Uh, and I think that might be an evolutionary stage that we'll see how it gets interconnected to other private DLT projects like uh, Settlement Coin um, and Hyperledger later on. Um, Maya, I know that this is something you've done before these guys even heard about blockchain. Um, can you tell us about... Uh, some, Don't make me blush. What, what are some of the That's theories behind this? Um, and uh, basically, how, how is this similar or different from things that are happening in like Zcash or Monero? So I think you 
there was a point, I think, that you, we would be talking to different enterprises and they had already done POCs and they played around and they really liked this whole concept of a distributed ledger and then you have to break the news and tell them a private blockchain is a transparency machine and every single one of, them com of their competitors can see exactly what every single other participant of that network can see. And so there was this whole huddle of how do we recreate privacy on that one ledger. Um, and there have been various uh, solutions, most of them all, you, all guy, you all know, um, trusted enclaves, uh, multi-party computations, and zero-knowledge proofs. And a lot of that effort has been in obfuscating the data, the state, the transactions, the origins, sender, receiver, balance from counterparties. Um, obviously, that comes out of cost, both in terms of resources of computational uh, uh, side, but also, at some point, we're also creating the blockchain and remaking that from a ledger into a verification network of the transactions of the balance. Um, and my personal opinion is how that fits into the business processes that we want to, ha to fit into the internet of value means that we're going to be transacting proofs of our private data. And essentially, the whole consensus is going to be about setting the rules of what computation is going to run at each data silo and only verifying the inputs and the output on the, on the blockchain itself. I guess we take, I guess I'd agree with that, and I guess we take it, like, an additional approach, which is, um, and it's almost like it's only when you sort of zoom out you realize, and I guess I think you know, climatics is the same because I mean, George will talk about some of the work they're doing, but I think people may, maybe don't realize just quite how ambitious some of the work we're actually um, undertaking right now is. So, so we're keeping, a, so it's from, 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 a, from a quarter perspective, we're keeping a close eye on where the zero knowledge proof um, research community takes it. If you look at the underlying transaction um, model of quarter, the, we, for the programmers in the room, look at the, the verify function, it's, in, it's deliberately written. As a, as, a, as, a, as a pure function, no side effects, um, returns a boolean. So that um, when general purpose, when, when so zero knowledge proof technology is sufficiently general purpose that we can trans, we can trans, um, you know, we can transform pretty much arbitrary code into the appropriate circuit. You know, we're good to go. But we need a strategy for what we do before that happens, because that's a long way off. Um, and you know, we look at you know, we, we, we look at the, the the high profile sort of like emergency fixes that have had to be applied to current deployments of zero knowledge proofs, and, and it kind of scares us. Um, so what we're doing in parallel, and you can almost regard it as a hedge, but it's a pretty ambitious one. Is we're we're, we're working very closely with trusted enclave technology to be able to run um, contract verification in Java in a secure enclave. And this comes back to the point I was making earlier, which is it's no good building a system that only five rocket scientists can write for. It we're only going to have an impact at a global level if average programmers can deploy stuff, stuff successfully. So, um, so as a stepping stone towards this, because it's a multi-year effort, we've actually just open sourced um, something that I think is, will be actually interesting to people outside the blockchain community as much as inside it, which is a Java virtual machine running inside Intel SGX. That developer preview was released last uh, last month, um, and it's fully functional. You can even connect to um, sort of like a signed enclave that, that we're running that was signed by the key we have from Intel. So um, you know, if, if you're at all interested in that, go look at it. We're making big strides, and you know, Java and SGX is a big deal. So, so go take a look. Yeah, I, I think I'd agree with Maya that um, mm. privacy and blockchains are kind of slightly orthogonal concepts in that blockchains are designed to be open and transparent, <laughs> yet people want to transact uh, with privacy. So for me, uh, confidentiality is a somewhat better word, or, or obfuscation, uh, so hide, hiding or making it difficult to infer uh, data. And we, you know, we've been very active in this research space. We, we did a, a ring signature-based Tumblr. Uh, we've done a, a prototype with, with SGX. We moved uh, elements of the EVM into, into SGX. And most recently, uh, we've open sourced um, Zeth, an implementation of zero cash on Ethereum. But I think, as, as Richard said, this is still an emergent area. Um, and especially for enterprise, many of the crypto cryptographic techniques used uh, are still very early, and, and people are concerned about those. I mean, just, just as an example, um, you know, it, 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 it's taken as a given that you know, the standard crypto schemes you use in a, in a blockchain are um, you know, various, uh, various elliptic curves. You know, I can think of several banks for whom anything that isn't RSA is like 
alien technology. <laughs> but there's also some banks that went out of their way to actually implement the first bulletproofs, mm -hmm. i.e. ING, yeah. and then they open sourced it so the academic community was, was able to pinpoint the vulnerability in their uh, code. I wanted to make a point that um, I find that the, the sci-fi moon math that is being done in, in, privacy comp in private computation is really a dialogue between the public blockchain work and the private blockchain. Because if we're talking of blockchains as distributed computational resources, the amount of computation needed to run any of these uh, proofs, whether or not it's on SGX or uh, ZKPs, fits right into the incentive designs that are being built either by Zcash or um, just the other day, the first uh, Zeex uh, protocol that came out, which I think is a fascinating way of thinking about someone else running the computation for these proofs and incentivizing them via V cryptocurrencies. Mm. And the, the, course, the dialogue, the back and forth between the experimentations uh, going on on public botching, the academic research, and these guys sitting down with corporates and explaining how private computation can actually get us to the holy grail of not only having digital streamlined workflows, but also disintermediating a lot of those uh, workflows that are unnecessary because we don't need the data reconciliation function that we were so reliant on um, in legacy systems. It's, it's, it's true, and just, just, just the language you're using kind of makes the, the point, because I guess all of us as we speak to corporates, you know, people, people like me, people like our um, you know, off-field engineers, they have to explain this stuff to you know, serious people inside, you know, inside the, the IT departments of, of, of large institutions. And you, know, they, you, know, you think about the, the, um, the incentive structure that acts upon these people. These people's job is to protect the integrity of their firm's IT systems. There is no upside to them from deploying something innovative. You know, the, you know, a good day for them is that the bank doesn't get hacked. Um, it's all downside if they prove something that goes wrong. Um, so we think a lot about how we can make this technology like, understandable to them and help them understand you know, where the risks are and what they can do to mitigate it. So, so maybe just, just one, one point on privacy. You know, one of the reasons we're taking the approach we are is because we ask ourselves, in the event uh, part of this were proven not to work, you know, that, so, so we know that you know, we know there's been things like you know, Meltdown and Spectre, there have been some, you know, there's a, some of the approaches Intel has taken to designing its chips we, are having to be rethought. You know, what, if, what if Intel SGX were just catastrophically broken? You know, what would happen? So we've designed our roadmap for it such that if that happened, you know, do we sacrifice integrity or a bit of privacy? And, we, and the point is, you never want to sacrifice integrity. So we show how what happens is the, um, the system's properties degrade to business as usual quarter privacy, which is actually pretty good as, as it is. You just lose that extra bit. But being able to show people how, you know, if this fails, this is what it degrades to. I guess it's almost a bit like sort of like you know, failure of airline systems. You go down from one level of assurance to the next. You have to be able to have these conversations, otherwise you just don't get past the people whose job it is to say no to protect their firm. But we are at a yeah. turning point, and I think um, this is happening within a macro environment where the concept of having a financial market infrastructure for transacting private data and proving just computation is becoming crucial to our general digital economy. If we're talking about Facebook and different identity leaks, if we're talking about um, the realization that a lot of the trusted notaries in our personal lives are really data aggregators. If we're talking about credit scores or we're talking about the Facebooks of the world and their hidden tech stack data captures that um, we have no say or uh, purview as to what is happening, suddenly there is this convergence again between private data, private personal data and uh, financial market infrastructure and the need for both to kind of fit in to that um, same technology. So we're, try we're getting close to the end here, and I know you've been trying to avoid the question, so I'm going to skip right to that one. Um, <laughs> the next 12 months, what can you guys commit to delivering that's actually going to be useful for the people in this room, and maybe even give something back to the cryptocurrency community for once? <laughs> wow, that was... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> give, give something back. To me. So, so well, okay. So, so in quotes, give something back. I mean, I, I wasn't joking when I said take a look at um, Java Ring and Intel SGX. So that, that dev preview is um, take a look at it. There's, I mean, the, the team who built that are 
really impressive. It's a really impressive piece of work. In terms of what's coming up over the next 12 months, so the two things I focus on, because I guess they're the two sides of my job, are clients going live um, or going from live to live at scale and, and features coming in the platform. So in terms of clients going live, you know, I, I talked about Lendicom, the syndicated lending platform, B3I, HQLAX. There's, there's a whole bunch of like significant Marco Polo, Voltron. There's a whole bunch of, you, know, you Google the names and you see these like significant projects on Corda going live at scale. Um, and because people are saying, you know, when are we going to see the impact of enterprise blockchain? It's this year. It, it, it's real and it's coming. And if I then look at you know, what's coming down the line um, with, with, with Corda, um, there's a few things. Um, one is, um, and I think this will be transformational back to the STO conversation people are having, is the forthcoming tokens toolkit. So this is a really, the team spent a lot of time on this, a really well thought out approach to how you model different types of tokens, fungible and non-fungible. Kind of think of it like you know, ERC-20, 721, those kind of ideas, but turbocharged and, and brought to the Java world. Um, there's that, there's the um, furtherance, furtherance of the SGX work. Um, support for accounts in Corda, so you can actually have multiple, um, you know, multiple users, if you like, in the same node. There's some really um, interesting features to, to solve problems that clients have asked for. And I guess that's been the interesting and kind of rewarding thing. A lot of Corda was driven by our initial work with our members and our own design. Now we're getting really high quality um, requirements from our customers, and they're now getting delivered. So it's, um, it's an, gonna be an exciting year. George? So I think for us, uh, we're continuing to work extremely hard to, to deliver USC and doing the hard yards on the regulation, the, the legal work, mm -hmm. and then on, on the technology layer. So um, I think we will continue to push for, for member-owned and governed networks and, and what that means for the enterprise. I think we see that uh, the real value of, of blockchain is, is perhaps beyond the technology and, and for what, what it can introduce uh, beyond what we currently have. Um, I think we're likely to see a, a couple of other networks uh, running on Autonity. Um, and then moving more into, uh, moving out of POC phase, I guess. So there, there are so many proofs of concepts running on, on Ethereum, Corda, Hyperledger. I think we're really seeing now enterprise, uh, the, the, particularly the USC project, uh, there's a, a huge amount of work to, to allow these enterprises to, to transact, so to, for them to integrate their systems, to go through the internal uh, risk analysis, to go through the legal, the compliance. So the, for me, the, the core technology stack is there, and it's now about adoption, and, and we'll be working very hard to, to enable that. I actually think that a lot of use cases that we've seen in POCs are going to be canceled in the next yes. year because people are actually going to sit down in front of their budget and see how much integration, implementation, um, not only the legal and compliance costs are going to uh, necessitate, and then they're going to realize maybe it's the ROI is just negative on blockchain for that particular thing and that <laughs> particular thing, and then suddenly, yeah. But we're also going to see, I think, more and more interoperable uh, POCs between chains, first between the private chains, and then one of them is, might be the, f I'm, I'm pretty, I don't know who the first, I have no suspicion, who the first private chain that will go as a second layer on top of a public chain will be. Um, but I Just think we're going to see me, that. You show me a public chain that can offer me transaction finality, and I'll do a POC with you the next day. <laughs> okay, so you're <laughs> not Corda. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So, and that's a really interesting point. Um, do you see things like, uh, just kind of bouncing off that, uh, layer two technologies inside of a permission blockchain? Does that type of thing happen, like a lightning network or plasma? I think you are going to see different implementations and maybe even have that interoperability happen via vCosmos or something like that. Um, I think it's interesting that a lot of supposedly layer two projects that raise money ended up going to a hyperledger consortia and then saying, oh, actually we're doing security there. Um, so you're, you're going to see this whole back and forth between projects as they're debating it um, as, as far as their money will allow them to experiment. Um, they can just raise another ICO. Sorry? They can just raise another ICO. That's no problem. Or they can come go to the world's richest quadrillionaire. Uh, and I, ask I do for come some with PTK. benevolence. Yeah. Thank you very much, panelists. Um, it's been very insightful. I've learned a ton about this. Um, and we hope to see everything come live, and I'm uh, very excited about it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks.